Welcome to the Diminutive Soldier. Today I'm going to talk about the biggest board game I've talked about as of yet. This is the monster Rune Wars of Fantasy Flight Games. It takes place in the Runebound universe. Now, this is a 4X-ish type game. Um, think Twilight Imperium, but fantasy. Uh, if that sounds interesting to you, then you're going to want to stick around and really watch this. Here's the sad thing. Rune Wars, for some reason, several years ago, went out of print. This is Rune Wars First Edition. They came out with a revised edition, um, which is known as not as good um, uh, when it comes to the components. But they changed a few rules, which I think make them improve on the game. Uh, and then it went out of print. And then they came out with Rune Wars. They called it Rune Wars, a completely different game. A uh, miniatures combat game, uh, pushing the miniatures around on the board. Think of old school fantasy flight with move. I meant, I'm sorry, form of fantasy with movement trays. I don't know why they called it Rune Wars again. Very different game. But this is a game where you're going to build your forces, you're going to spread out across the map, taking cities, um, sending out heroes to go on quests, trying to either recruit or destroy neutral. Um, parties, these giants here, or these beast men, or a dragon, and use them or destroy them. Uh, and you're trying to, to collect six dragon runes. You start out with two, you're trying to, so you're trying to collect four more and keep what you got. Whoever gets the six first wins. Let's get down to the board to see how the game plays, how it works. I'll do a quick little playthrough, and then at the end of the video, I'll give you my final thoughts and my review. So the rule book breaks down how you set up Runebound, and I've already set up the map here for you to get it started. Basically, each player is going to draw quest cards from this quest deck, and they'll have map tile numbers on them. You'll draw two, so you'll get those two map tile numbers. The opponent will draw two, get the other two map tile numbers, and then go and in turn order, you'll place one, they'll place another, and it says how map tiles have to be placed. They have to um, have two sides touching each other. However, these mountain sides and these water sides, like over there, can't um, uh, butt against each other. Um, and then once you place those out, you place each party, each faction has their home tiles. This is one for the undead. There's one over there for the humans. There's a few other factions as well. There's elves. Um, there's chaos. So right now I've set up the undead and the humans. And then you lay out your city tiles randomly, which are these, which I'll get to soon what they mean. And then every tile has on them what neutral um, characters, villains are placed. And so I'll play some. Here's a Here's a little beast man, for instance. Here's the dragon neutral miniature. Okay. And here's some of the human miniatures. There's a knight and a soldier. We got archers as well. And here's some of the undead miniatures I'll show you. There's an archer, undead archer, undead warrior. I place them out. You then place your strongholds in your starting locations. You place one stronghold. So my human stronghold I placed here. My undead stronghold I placed here. I'll show you an up close to the map in a moment. Um, once you place, once you place everything out in the map. You get your faction cards. Now here's what a faction card looks like. And it states you start out with two tactics cards. You start out with three influence. And these are your resources. And you start here on these, the red number. So for food, you, humans start at three, meaning they can start the game with two warriors, which I've placed out. Wood, they start at two. This means they can start the game with one archer, which i placed out. And stone... Uh, you start at two, which means one night, which I placed out. As you take territories, 
each territory has what resources on it. These can increase, and meaning whenever you recruit, you can gain more. Uh, with stone, eventually you can build siege towers, and it can also with wood. And when you attack, it has on here what your units do. There's another place because there is an expansion with a game that can add more units. And yet again, I'll get to how attacks work soon. You're also going to start with two um, tactics cards that you can use generally during combat. You're going to start with two quests, which you can send heroes on, and you're going to start with one random hero. For instance, here's the human's hero, Landric the Wise, and I place them over there. There's his miniature. So how the game works, multiple turns, and within each turn there's four rounds for each season. So you're going to flip over a season card, and that's what these are. There's spring, summer, fall, and winter. So you always start with spring, and you flip over the spring card. Every season card will have um, these symbols on the bottom for that season. What this one means, for instance, is you return all order tokens, you remove them off the map, which we'll get to that soon. Some, whenever you move units on a map, you'll have to place order tokens out, meaning they can't move again. You replace, um, reshuffle all of your um, um, action cards, and any units that are routed stand back up. Now, Every season card also has something on the top that happens for that one round. This one says each player may draw one tactics card for each area he controls that contains a city. No one does right now, so we won't draw a tactics card. So it's spring. This is the first round of the first turn. So there is no remove order tokens. There is no shuffle in your cards again. Your action cards, every faction has the same action cards. They're just themed toward the faction, but they all say the same things. So when it's your turn, you can play one of your faction cards. And I'll go through them. You can garrison. When defending in battle this season, you gain plus two strength. So it may come in handy sometimes. Strategize says move any of your units and heroes to adjacent, friendly, or empty areas. Do not activate the areas. What activate means is if you're moving some, some actions, for instance, let me find one, mobilize. Activate an area and move any of your units to it from up to two areas away. Activate an area means you put this order token down. So you'll place it. So let's say the undead was playing this. Let's say I wanted to move to this city up here. I'd place their order token down. That's the hero order token, but bear with me. And activated that area and say I move these units there. Well, now they're in that area with that, that order token. So that means they cannot activate again this entire year until we get back to spring. And if you remember, it says I can remove all order tokens. So that's what that means. So that strategize card said move any of your units and heroes. To adjacent friendly or empty areas do not activate it so that means they can move and later you can move them again but they can't not they cannot attack because you're moving to friendly or empty there's harvest reset your resource dials based on the areas you control so as you expand you gain more areas you have to play harvest to change your status here to increase or if you've lost areas even some may decrease um, if you play that It'll just be based on what you're at at that time. Fortify. Perform any of the following once each. You can lose one ore in wood to build a stronghold in an area you control. Lose one ore to repair one of your strongholds. Choose two friendly areas. You may f freely move rune tokens between them. Rune tokens, which I didn't explain and set up. Uh, at the beginning of the video, I said how you win the game. You collect six dragon runes you start out with two the base game the first edition game states that you place your rune tokens in your starting area you have two dragon runes and one 
false room, meaning there's nothing there. So for instance, you see I flip this over. They have question marks. This one has nothing there. It's a false one. And the other two, if I flip this one over, has a dragon room. So I've placed them. I placed one dragon room all the way as far as I can be. And I placed one right here with my fortress. The undead place a dragon room uh, as far as it can be. And one of his fortress and one and one, the fake one up closer. The revised edition rules, which I like, um, they state you don't place your dragon runes in your starting area. You don't do that. They get placed out on the out on the board, out in the middle, and so it just makes it um, make the game a little faster and a little bloodier. But I'm just setting it up as per uh, first edition um, rules. So you can play fortify, and you can move your runes. You may go on quest. You may discover more runes. They may be out there. You may want to adjust them, move them a little further back um, towards your base. Acquire power, gain influence as provided by your resources. Your resources will say, like here, you can gain one influence. There, you can gain one influence. And eventually, you'll be able to use influence to do different things throughout the game. Recruit, recruit units based on one of your resource types. Choose food, wood, ore, and whatever unit uh, you can recruit there. Mobilize, activate an area. Let's put one of those order tokens down and move any of your units to it from up to two areas away. So you can move and attack. Rally support. For each city you control, gain neutral units, tactics cards, influence, or quest cards. So let's say I control this city. What it means by control is I have a unit there. So this city states on it, I can, if I play this card, rally support, I can gain one neutral unit, one square neutral unit, which I'll get to in a second. I could gain one tactics card. I could gain two influence, or I could gain one new quest card. A square neutral unit. Here's a little cheat sheet for all the neutral units here. You can see. Here's their symbols. The square neutral unit is the hellhound. So you can gain one neutral unit, and as long as the neutral unit that you have that's on your side, as long as you have friendly troops there, some of your, for instance, human troops there with them, then they can move with you and they can fight with you. Once you they're on their own, they're alone, they go neutral again. They're not on your side anymore. And these symbols come into play when it comes to combat, which we'll get to momentarily. There's conquer, activate an area, and move any of your units to it from up to two areas away. Uh, let's attack again, and then we're back to the beginning. Now these things on the bottom... These are supremacy bonuses. So what that means is every time you play one of these cards, once per the whole year, if it's the highest card you've played that year, you can decide to do the bottom supremacy bonus. And they all have special things. I'm not going to go through every one of them. But let's say Garrison, when defending, you gain plus two strength. If this is the highest card you've played this entire year, recruit two triangle units. And yet again, your faction has, like here's a triangle unit for humans as a bowman or a footman. So that, that one was, Garrison was a zero. So really, you can only do that if that's the first card you play the entire year, so in spring, unless you played another zero before. Um, Nope, that is the only zero. So it's only the first time you do it. Now you can do harvest. Re reset your resource dials based on the areas you control. And if this is the highest card you've played all year, gain any bonuses provided by your developments. You'll be able to upgrade your, your fortresses uh, and have developments. You can put upgrades on them that will say um, give more resources, more units, etc. And you may lose one wood to build a development at a friendly stronghold. So that's how you build a development. Lose a wood, create a development at one of your strongholds. This one, recruit. If this is the highest one you played all year, then recruit. Remember, because it's recruit based on one of your resource types. Then recruit 
Units based on a second resource type, so you can recruit a lot more. This is the highest one. After you mobilize, move two units away, you may resolve this card a second time, as long as you do not start a second battle. So, yet again, I'm going to backtrack. The spring card has been drawn. It's now spring. Both factions choose an action card secretly and place it face down. So let's say the humans... They want to, no, 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 no. They want to strategize. They're going to place that card face down. And the undead, don't be secret. I don't want you to know what I'm doing. The undead, placing that card face down. So you flip them over. And see who has the highest. It's the undead. The undead will go first. They want to activate an area and move any of their units to it from up to two areas away. So they're just going to get into it. And they want to, let's say they're going to um, attack or recruit one of these neutral units. So activate that area. I'm sorry, I'm going to put these back where they were. And move any of your units to it from up to two areas away. So I'm going to move any of them. I'm going to move... Oh, see here, there's a mountain there. So these guys cannot move through that mountain. So there's a mountain here that blocks movement. So these guys cannot move that way. So only these two will be able. I have an undead warrior. And I have a necromancer. So I activated this area. I moved those two units through it. I'm going to scan the board now that we're close here. Here's the human side. See, each map tile has the resources if you control it, if you have units there. And that symbol is just what neutral unit starts. This is the dragon symbol. This has water. You cannot pass it until it's winter, and then it's frozen over. The mountains, you can never pass them unless you have flight. And then there's the, the cities. Oh, forgot to put that back. That you, If you control, you gain those abilities. You play the card. So the undead have moved in that space with that neutral hellhound. Now the undead have a choice. They could fight it, try to just kill it, take that area, or they can attempt to ally with the hellhound, to have the hellhound join them. They have to use influence in order to do so. The undead only have two influence. Um, but let's say they do. You spend influence... However much influence you spend is how many cards you're going to draw. So, just for the sake of the game, let's say they spent both their influence is gone. Let's see if they can get that Hellhound on their side. So now they're going to draw two of these, these cards. These cards are used not just for diplomacy, seeing if you can get a neutral unit on your side. These cards are also used for combat and a few other things. They spend influence, two influence, so they're going to draw two cards. You flip them over. And on these, when you're doing diplomacy, you're just you're looking at these top symbols here, and you get to pick one of them. Well, he he only drew two of these, which means the the neutral unit attacks you. That's what that means. If you drew, let's say this one, this means the neutral unit retreats; it runs away. And if you draw this one with his star on it, that means the neutral unit allies with you. So it didn't go how he wished. Now discard these cards to the side. It didn't go how he wished. Now the neutral unit is going to attack him. So now we draw cards for each unit in the attack. The neutral unit here is a hellhound. This is a little cheat sheet. And I'm attacking with uh, a skeleton warrior and a necromancer. So at the beginning of a combat round, you move your units to your battle board here and place them. Where they go, you move the hellhound and place him 
on his location. And you start from top to bottom, working your way down. I'm sorry, that's a, a warrior. He goes down here. So first, my necromancer is going to go. He is a um, number two, initiative two. So I'm going to draw a card for him. His symbol is a circle, so I look at the circle. Nothing. He doesn't do anything. Thanks a lot, Necromancer. Normally, he has a special power, which if it showed that his symbol, he would um, raise the dead, and you would um, you'd get reinforcements there, which is awesome. Next, you work your way down. My warrior is initiative four, but the Hellhound's initiative three, so now the Hellhound's going to go first. He is a square. We're going to draw his. Ah, this means his special ability goes off. Let's read what his, the Hellhound special ability is. The Hellhound special ability says, Burning. Your opponent must choose two of his standing units. Deal each chosen unit one damage. Yikes. So, I only got two units. They only have one life each. They're both destroyed. That Hellhound wiped out that warrior and that necromancer in one fell swoop. And the warrior now doesn't get to go. His initiative was after the Hellhound, and he's dead. So that's that. So that's the the undead player win. Let me show you what some of the other symbols on combat cards are. This means you do one damage. This is your special ability yet again, like what the Hellhound did. This means you route that many enemies. You can do two damage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was the Undead Warrior activation card. So now it's the Hero's activation. We do Mobilize, activate an area, move any of your units to it from up to two areas away. So let's say we're going to activate this area with this city. We're going to move two. We're going to move any of our units to it from up to two areas away. I'm going to move. Let's get down closer and I'll show you. So I played Mobilize to move all units up to two spaces away, and I said I was going to move to that city, but of course I cannot move through neutral or enemy units. I can only move through empty or friendly. So I cannot do that. Instead, I'm going right here, and I'm moving everyone up, and I want to try to destroy that sorcerer. So yet again, I take everyone and I place them next to their locations on my board. And it has their initiatives, one, two, three. So the archer and sorcerer are going to go simultaneously, drawing cards. So let's see how that pans out. So first I'm going to draw a card for my archers. They're triangles. They just do one damage. Sorcerer has one life. So the sorcerer's going to die, but since they're simultaneous, he can go as well. The sorcerer is a circle. Nothing happens. He doesn't do anything. So sorcerer is just dead. So I've now controlled that area because I have units there. So that's the end of the spring season. We'll now go to summer. We flip summer over. So in summer, this symbol says it's now the quest phase. Your heroes can go out on quest. During the quest phase, you can uh, each hero can heal themselves. They can train to level up a stat, or they can move. And after moving, depending on where they end, they can start a duel with an enemy's hero. They can duel them, or they can attempt a quest. And the first edition is the only way you can move heroes, except for, um, which card is it? Except for strategize. Move any of your units and heroes to adjacent. In the second edition rules, you can also move heroes playing, which a card I've already played, Mobilize, which in first edition only says activate 
only units. You can also move heroes, and same with conquer. So in second edition, your heroes can move around quicker, uh, and a lot of people say a lot of people prefer that and like that a lot more. So let's see, my hero, my old man's over here. When you move, you can move up to two spaces away. I got two quests here. I got 9A, which is all the way over here. Or I got 8A, which is right there. And I can actually get to 8A. I can move my hero one, two, move around that mountain, and plop on down. Now the hero doesn't have to worry about the, the neutral unit attacking him or anything like that. The hero is out there alone on his quest, hiding from it, I guess. A sorcerer has been raiding caravans crossing through the ruby gate. It is unclear what he is after, but it is clear that he must be stopped. You feel a powerful presence in these woods. I have to duel one sorcerer. If I defeat the sorcerer, I receive a reward. Sometimes rewards can be items you can use for a hero. Sometimes rewards can be dragon runes, which yet again, you get six of them, you win the game. So, I have to duel a sorcerer. So, here's my hero card. When I duel, if I have my special ability, I just deal one damage. And he's going to be a circle. At the start of the duel, this hero may test wisdom. If he gets one of these symbols, he can cancel the duel. How you test, yet again, one of these cards. If you remember, when trying to gain the neutral unit, you'll draw for his wisdom. You drop the four of them. Here's two, three, four. And you look at the top symbol here. That one is this. So I could cancel the duel. But I don't want to cancel the duel. I want to kill this guy. Because if I have to defeat him to receive the reward. So I'm going to duel him. I draw this for my hero. He's a circle. He does nothing. The sorcerer draws this, the sorcerer is going to do one damage to my hero. One damage to my hero, it's not a good start. My hero has two life left. You do four rounds of duels. This should be simple and easy for my hero because the sorcerer is only one life. Let's go on the second round. Sorcerer draws. Oh yeah, there we go. I did one damage. And... I'm sorry, my, that was my hero drawing. The sorcerer draws. Ah, crap. He does his special ability. Which it says, the sorcerer's special ability. For each of your sorcerers... Oh, each of your sorcerers has two health until the end of the battle. So, I did one damage to that sorcerer, but he leveled himself up. So he has one life left now. My hero, third round, is going to attack again. Does nothing. Sorcerer attacks again. Crap. Well, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't stack the two health. So. Hero is going to attack. Finally kills that dango sorcerer. They were just shooting lightning bolts back and forth with each other. So I finish that quest. was wild. And I get a reward. I draw from the reward deck. A staff of light. During your turn, you may discard this card to stand a number of friendly routed figures in this area equal to my wisdom. So my wisdom is four. So if after a large battle, which eventually there will be large battles, I get a lot of units routed. My hero's there. He can use that staff of light, stand four of them back up, which could be potentially pretty powerful. Um, now it is the Necromancer can move his hero two spaces in quest. He has 7A and 6A. 6A is literally just right here. So let's move him down. See what 6A says. Finding your way to the Valley of Souls is the easy part. It is named in memory of the travelers who never returned from his labyrinth-like caves. 
So I have to test my wisdom. This is my hero here. His wisdom is three. During the quest phase, you may destroy two triangle or one square unit up to one area away instead of healing, moving, or training this hero. That is pretty dang powerful once you get close to the enemy. Wow. So, test three, wisdom. One, two, three. Wow, I have one of every symbol. So let's see what choices I have here. For those two, orders found in the calmest of minds receive a reward. For this one, I must retreat. Well, luckily, I can use one of those. Order is found. Receive. I can receive one reward. We'll draw this reward. Shard. If this hero is at one of your strongholds during your turn, you can discard this card to gain one dragon room. So, I move that hero. I can move him back to a stronghold. I either have one there as I build further ones. And then a, a dragon rune will drop at that location. Now, the enemy could take that location and take that dragon rune if they control it. But that's a way that I can now gain a second dragon rune. So the summer, that happened, the quest part. And then up here, performing an influence bid, the highest bidder must choose and reveal a friendly or enemy rune token. If it is a dragon rune, it is discarded. How you bid, form an influence bid, is you secretly get your influence. This enemy will put however much influence wants to bid secretly in his hand. This one's secretly in his hand. And then when you're ready, flip them over and whoever wins. Well, the undead has no influence. So the humans, I'm just going to bid one because I can automatically win. Choose and reveal a friendly or enemy rune token because a dragon is discarded. I'm going to presume the undead player put one as far back as he could. Ah, indeed he did. That rune token is out of the game. That hurt that undead player quite a bit. And now, it's the summer turn. Yet again, each player picks one of their order cards. They already have the one they've played this year. They'll pick another one. Let's say the undead player does... Oh, he's lost to quite a bit of guys, hasn't he? He's going to secretly play Recruit. And the human player... I was going to play strategize with the human player and move those units to the city. I cannot. If you recall, I had to place an order token down because they moved up and attacked that neutral unit. That order token means they cannot move again until it's springtime. Once springtime comes back, if you recall, all order tokens are removed. So I can't move any of those again. See, I shouldn't have moved all of them forward. I could have had some to move again. So instead, instead, I believe they'll just recruit. So we flip them over. They're both equal. So who has the most influence? Humans. They will go first. Recruit units based on one of your resource types. So I'm going to pick Food and recruit two footmen. Let me get my bag of miniatures here. And you can put them at strongholds or in your starting location. Right now, I don't have any extra strongholds out, so I'm just going to stick them right here. And I'm going to go ahead. This is my highest card so far I've played this year. I'm going to go ahead and use this. Recruit units based on second resource type. And I'll do that, or, and I could place one knight. I'm going to stick him right here. So I'm done. Human's done. Necromancer's going to go. And he's also going to recruit. He's going to recruit two reanimates, is what they're called, two undead warriors. 
He's also going to stick them at his outpost here. And he's also going to use the second ability, I mean the supremacy bonus, to recruit off a second resource type. And he wants to get a necromancer back out on the board. So he stuck him there. And that's summer. Summer is done. We're going to autumn. When you draw autumn, we do this down here. Reshuffle all the fate cards back in one deck. Those are the cards we use for combat, duels, testing. So we reshuffle all of them together. So that's done. And then each player either receives two influence or one fate card. The undead player wants to receive two influence as he has none. Human already has two. They're equal on influence. The human could get four, but he's, you know, he, he's going to go ahead and receive a fate card. Fate cards, yet again, you, they tell you when you can use them. So here's one he received. Play during your turn. Discard any amount of influence to force a single opponent to discard an equal amount of influence. So if I had a whole bunch, I could discard two of them and make that undead player lose all of his. And now the autumn card says each hero matching its owner's alignment immediately receives a single reward card. Wow. Well, your starting heroes always match your alignment. You can recruit more heroes throughout the game, and you'll, you'll draw them from the deck, and they may match your alignment. They may not. If they don't, they can flee um, and, and run away uh, if they don't match your alignment. So... Each one receives a reward card. That's huge. Here's the undead players. Ice Storm. During your turn, you may discard this card to fo force your opponent to route a number of figures in this area equal to the hero's wisdom. Wow. He can so he can really get up in the enemy, do an Ice Storm, and knock several of them over, which really takes them out of the whole year. They can't do anything. Um, until spring when they'll stand back up or if you have some special ability for instance this hero had that staff that can make them stand back up and this hero will get black ring once per duel after resolving a fake card with this hero you can deal one damage to this hero to immediately deal another to your opponent i'll stick that right there now you'll see one thing this game is a table hog look this is only for two players you can play up Four or five players with the expansion. Uh, look at all the cards out here. It is a table hog, but all these types of big games really are now, aren't they? And so now, each player yet again plays an activation card. Um, the undead player really needs to move people forward. I think he just wants to get that city up there. He's going to play... Strategize. And the human player now has, since he recruited, he now has some units who can move. And the human player will play Conquer. So we flip their cards over. Human player is higher. He's going to go first. Activate an area and move any of your units to it from up to two areas away. So we're going to activate this area, meaning none of these troops will get to go again. Move any of my units to it from up to two areas away. I will move just one horse. That's all I'm doing. So these two units can still go if need be. And now that horse controls, we control that city. The humans do. Undead player is going to go. Move any of your units to adjacent friendly or empty areas. Do not activate the areas. So I'm going to move these units up to this empty city area, and that says do not activate that area, meaning they could go again. So now, at the end of autumn, let's go down the board. The humans are moved up. They've taken a city. And the undead have moved up and also have taken a city, as you can see. It's winter time.
flip over the winter card. And winter's harsh. This says the max number of units you can have in one area is equal to your food level. If they're more than that, you have to kill excess. So let's start there. My undead food level is three. Got three right there, two right there, I'm good. My human food level is three. Got two right there, one right there. Oh no, I got four up there. So I'm going to have to kill one of them. I'm going to kill a footman. He dies. He starves to death. And this says all water locations, borders, I should say, are now frozen and you can move freely between them. It doesn't really matter right here. Um, sometimes it does. Uh, one game I've played, the water literally blocked um, the enemy from even getting to my starting location, just how I had it set up, and uh, which was pretty amazing. And so he had to wait till winter to try to cross it. And there's the Wizards Council perform an influence bid. The highest bidder chooses one of his heroes. He may move the chosen hero to any area or have him gain one reward card. Wow. So secret bid. So yet again, you would bid secretly. The undead bid two. The human bid one. See, the undead warded. He can move his, his guy up to any place he wants or gain a reward card. To be honest, gaining a reward card is pretty sweet. So he's going to do that. He gets Dwarven Firebombs. Dang, now when he attacks on a special, he deals three damage. Then tests his agility, which his is three. You say you'll draw three cards, and for any of those, the red symbol, which are pretty likely, he takes damage. He blows himself up a little bit. So this is the last round of the year. Each faction will play a card. And Dad's going to play Rally Support for any city he controls. And the human will play... Ah, I was looking. I was like, well, I'll move those two war those two units up. I'm going to try to capture that dragon, but I can't do it. I've already played these two cards this year. And I only got one influence. It would be very unlikely I would get that dragon. That dragon would go and probably destroy both of those units. That probably wouldn't go very well. So... Hmm. I'm going to play Harvest. So they both flip the card they played over. Oops. The undead goes first. They can't do their supremacy bonus. I know it's very high because remember they already used that ability uh, this year with Recruit. So they can only do the top for each city you control, gain neutral units, tactics cards, influence, or quest cards. Here's they only control one city. So they can gain neutral units, um, which would be a Razor Wing or a Beast Man. They gain one of those, two Texas cards, two Influence, or one Quest card. You can see how Influence can be pretty powerful, um, not just with trying to get units to, to join you, but as things pop up, like that Wizards Council trying to outbid. So they're going to gain the two Influence. The Humans, yet again, they can't do the bottom. They already did. There's for the year. Reset your resource dials based on the areas you control. Have their resource dials already set on their home territory. So let's see what I can add to it now. I now took this territory here, which is two food, and this one, which is one wood. So now I can go up, and two food, and go up. So now when I recruit, I'll be able to recruit three warriors and two archers. There's also cards that say you can gain influence, you can gain tactics cards based on it, and whatnot. But now, I'll be able to recruit better. So that's the end of that round. That's the end of the year. You'll start back at spring. I'm just going to show you how it goes. You'll draw another spring card. Spring card says, remove all the order tokens on the board. So those areas where they couldn't activate again, well, that's now gone. 
you reshuffle all your action cards. I mean, not shuffle. You just put them back in your deck. And if there were any routed units, they now stand up, and they're good to go for the year. And then you continue on. You read this. Each player may draw one tactics card for each area he controls that contains a city. So both of them will be able to draw one tactics card and keep going. Eventually, you're going to be fighting each other. You're going to have pretty large battles. The undead has all kind of units he can use. Special one in the base game. There's the dragon, which comes with the expansion. The humans have their siege tower, which is a special one in the base game. And this dude comes with his expansion. I want to talk about let's just how combat works if there's a stronghold involved. So let's say the undead continued to move forward and he built a stronghold way out here. And there's a dragon rune there. And he has these forces in that location. And the humans, let's say, he had all these guys in that location. Okay? Let me get down close. So let's say the undead warrior built his stronghold. He has that army there. The humans have that army there, and they're, he moves forward, and they're going to fight. So yet again, we have to place them out on their battle boards. So the reanimates. Here's a skeleton archer who's going to go first. Reanimates. Here's the necromancer. And then the human battle board. We have the bowman. We have a knight. A knight. And three. Footman. So let's go to the battle. Let's see what happens. Here's how the fight's going to work. Let's say the, the humans were the attackers. They can play any fate cards. I'm sorry. They can play any tactics cards they have. This one, play when an opponent takes control of one of your strongholds. Nope. Play before choosing an order card. Nope. He doesn't have any. Does the defender have any he wants to play? Play during a battle. Stand up to four of your routed units. You don't have any routed yet. Play during your turn. When an opponent takes control of your stronghold. Nope. So, we're going to go in and attack. The humans are going to draw one card for their bowman. Which is a triangle. Nothing happens. The necromancers also have a bo uh, um, initiative one bowman. They're going to draw and do one damage. So the humans choose who to put that damage on. Their horses can take two. They're going to stick one on one of those horses. We're going to go to initiative two. The humans have two horses. So they're going to draw two cards. And these are the squares here. So one damage and route one enemy. So the enemy is going to choose who they're going to put one damage on. They're going to choose to go ahead and kill that archer. He already went first, so they're just going to kill him off. And they have to route somebody, which means they tip him over. So they're going to tip over that reanimate. He doesn't get to attack or anything. And he's, he's routed, which means he can come back later. Um, the necromancer is going to go, and he has his... He draws his card... Ooh, he gets a special ability. Necromancer special ability, raise dead, gain two reanimates, and add them to this battle. Oh, God. The human player is immediately regretting everything. And look, now the necromancer, even though it's not doesn't really need it, doesn't really matter, he says, screw it. He's going to stand up four of his routed units and or heroes. It was only that one got routed. The necromancer said, arise. And this tactics card is discarded. So now the humans have three warriors. He's going to draw us three cards, looking for triangles. 
Nothing. Nothing. One damage. So he just kills one reanimate. Yeah. But they activate. Nope. I'm sorry. The warriors go before the reanimate. So he's dead outright. And the reanimates go. There's four of them left. So he's going to draw four cards. Looking at the triangles here. Special ability. Nothing. Special ability. Damage. So damage. He'll kill that one knight. Because if you place damage on it, you have to place any more. And then two special abilities. Let's see what the reanimate special abilities are. The reanimate special ability states, I'll pick it up and show you. Overrun, deal two damage if you have at least two standing reanimates. Oh, they do. So, they've got two special abilities. One of them deal two damage. It's going to kill another knight. The second one, overrun, deal two damage. Kill an archer and a warrior. So, the humans are reeling from that. They have two warriors left. That's the end of the whole battle round. Then you look and you determine who won the battle. First, you count how many people we have left. The humans have two. The uh, undead have one, two, three, four, five. And then you count the strength of the stronghold. Stronghold is five. You add that. So undead stronghold. So theirs would be ten for the humans two. The undead obviously win. They remain. The humans, the remainder of them, the two warriors, do not die. They're routed and they have to retreat. So they're going to fall back over here and they're routed, meaning they lay down. They can't do anything else. Um, but since the humans, uh, the undead didn't kill them outright, they did damage the undead strongholds, and now you'll flip that over, and it'll be three in case I attack it again. But the undead do have the option to repair it. And that's how combat works. The first edition of the game, your heroes can't um, assist and attack in any battles. They go on quests and they can duel each other. Um, it's basically really all they can do. Um, However, in the second edition rules, they added what they call Heroes Supporting Battles. And you can download these on Fantasy Flight's website. Heroes Supporting Battles, where you can have a hero in a battle, and the hero can boost your units. You can attach it to a unit. Like, so let's say I have it next to my, my footman. And then with my footman, when I draw cards over, I can, look, I can draw extra ones and choose uh, which ones I want. Um, so they, they boost your heroes. They, they support them, which I like a lot. Um, as I said earlier, the second edition rules also allows your heroes to move a little farther, a little quicker um, throughout the game. So it makes them a little more, um, uh, makes them a little more powerful. And I like in the second edition rules, you don't set up your runes in your home base area. You set up your starting runes out in the middle on the map. Um, so that's the basics overview. I just went through a whole year so you can see kind of how the gameplay works. The basics overview of the game. And uh, I'm going to go down and tell you what I think about it and give it a quick review. What do I think about the game? I think it's great. I don't understand why it ever went out of print. I think it's a fantastic game. They could have continued to expand upon. Um, the quality is superb these miniatures are great i love it even comes with little little mountains to put on your terrain tiles now i think the second edition one may not have come with the mountains first edition does qualities are fantastic the artwork is fantastic um, the gameplay is great the gameplay is fun uh, there there are parts that are fiddly to it but once you get it set up and really get going into it it goes quick it goes it goes fast um, i love each faction has the same action cards to play. So you have the same actions. Um, of course, it just depends on what you're, wanting to, what you're wanting to do and which ones you're going to play. You have the same actions, but each faction is different. Their um, resources are different with what they can recruit. And of course, their units are different with how they attack and what their special abilities are. I love the season cards. The season cards change things every round they have the basics of what you can do 
but there will be something special they add in every round. I love that it's not just to move your dudes and fight and battle and build fortresses and take um, resources and take positions and the dragon runes. It's not just that. You got your heroes. You got your quest you can go out on. You get more quests to go do different things. You may have a multi-level quest. You may have a, um, a quest where you got to go kill someone, a quest where you got to go uh, explore a temple. So there's, there's that element of the game. And it, it flows. It's, it doesn't overcomplicate it. it. It's really nice. The only, only downside of this game is it is a table hog. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of cards to it. So setup is a beast. But once you set it up, like I said, you get going, it flows. It flows so well, and it's much quicker than Twilight Imperium. It's a much quicker, fast-paced game, and you don't feel like you're just sitting back waiting for everyone else to do their thing. It, it doesn't happen like it does in larger and other large 4X games like Twilight Imperium. I'd rate this game a um, an 8, an easy 8, if not 8.5. If not 8.5. Like I said, the, the, the quality of everything is fantastic. The miniatures are very, very small. It is a little older game, so the miniatures are slightly dated. But they're great. I'm going to give it an 8. Solid 8. Uh, if you can find this game, it's out of print, get it. If you can find it, get the game. I'd, I'd recommend getting the first edition one and just downloading the changes to the rules. Um, because first edition, I hear the components are a little better than second edition. It comes with the mountains and whatnot. Second edition doesn't. Um, get it. Just do it. Hope you enjoyed. The Minute of Soldier, out.